Hi, everybody. Welcome to our May installment of the History Speaker Series. Um, I am very happy to have our speaker with me in person this evening, um, which is awesome. And I'll, I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, firstly, I would like to introduce the folks who you're seeing on screen. So, of course, we have Monica, who is the operations coordinator at OMA. Uh, many of you will have spoken with her on the phone already. Uh, we have Trish as well, who is the head of the history committee here at OMA. My name is Lindsay. I am the history programming coordinator here at OMA. Um, before we begin, I have a few um, thank yous to do. So. Um, firstly, I want to say a huge thank you to OMA's History Committee and Marianne Grant in particular, who coordinates with all of our speakers. And without her and without the committee and Trish, we would not be able to, to run this program as efficiently as I think we do. Um, I also want to thank Monica, of course, for running our Zoom um, and for putting up all the graphics and whatnot. And I wanna thank our partner over at Rogers TV, uh, Deanne, who is with us every time we do these and who helps us um, spread these to their own platform as well. So we're super grateful for our partnership with them. And now it is my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker for this evening. I'd like to introduce you to Rob McCron. Rob has been a member of the Legion for 23 years. Um, Rob is the Legion Curator and Public Relations Officer. Um, Rob and Rick Purcell have spent two years working on a project to memorialize uh, the role that the Fairmile played in our local history. And you're gonna learn a lot more about that this evening. Tonight, Rob will talk to you about the importance of the Fairmile um, within Aurelia's history. So I'm gonna pass it over to you now, Rob. Thanks so much, everybody. All right, sorry, I'm just gonna share screen here first so that I can get our project up and running. Bear with me here. Oh, Monica, can you uh, let me share yes, screen? Thank you. Sorry, I'm clicking away here. Try now? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. All right, Rob, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for viewing tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a little ship that made history, especially here in Aurelia. The ship is called the Fair Mile. For those of you who don't know who the fair mile, what the fair mile is, it uh, is a small uh, ship designed in Great Britain by a gentleman by the name of Noel Macklin. Noel Macklin, uh, previously to uh, the fair mile, he was a uh, well-known uh, automotive designer and uh, boat designer. When the war, World War II broke out, uh, Noel Macklin was asked to design a small ship that would uh, cruise up and down the coast of England uh, to search for German submarines. Uh, the Admiralty uh, asked him because he was so uh, well known on uh, designing boats or ships. I still call them boats. Most of you probably call them boats. Once they reach a certain size, they're uh, called ships. Uh, the Fair Mile was built as a kit boat, mainly because it was uh, easy to, uh, quick and easy to uh, build, and it was easy to ship. It came in pieces, just like your everyday model ship, model cars. Uh, it was quick, and uh, they needed that during the war. By the time uh, the Fair Mile uh, design got to uh, Canada, it was um, changed a little bit in size, mainly because of the Canadian government, government wanted to make sure that it would make its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, most of the uh, Fair Miles were built uh, here in Ontario. Uh, some were built out in uh, Vancouver area and some were built down the East Coast 
in uh, Nova Scotia. The uh, fair mile was uh, pretty well called a sub chaser. It had, um, his purpose was to patrol the uh, east and west coast of Canada. Uh, of course, in 1939, the war, World War II broke out and that uh, we also needed a, uh, a ship that would, could patrol, excuse me, patrol the uh, east and west coast and especially the St. Lawrence. The Fair Mile was a B-class ship. Uh, there was four different classes of ships. Um, the B-class had uh, 20 millimeter uh, Oakland uh, guns on it. It had 12 depth charges and the size of it was 112 foot long, uh, 17 feet, 10 inches wide, which is a, they call it a beam. And the draft, which is the depth it would be in the water was four foot, 10 inches. So it could go in shallow water. Uh, it weighed 79 tons and it was built with two inch mahogany planks, double planks on the hull and uh, regular planks on the deck. Uh, it was powered by uh, two Hall Scott 630 horsepower gasoline engines. And like I said, it was equipped with 20 millimeter guns, three 20 millimeter guns and 12 depth charges. Originally, uh, Hunter Boats, we're gonna go on to Hunter Boats now. Originally Hunter Boats was owned by Ditchburn boats out of Gravenhurst between 1924 and 31. Ditchburn built many pleasure crafts being up in Gravenhurst, but they did have a call for larger luxury uh, boats and they wanted to make sure that uh, they could travel down to Lake Ontario and possibly out to the East Coast. Ditchburn uh, bought some property down here in Aurelia and uh, they built uh, two big buildings so they can accommodate the bigger, uh, bigger boats. Uh, the buildings were uh, built in 1930, I think it was, and um, they lasted till, Ditchburn lasted till 1932 when uh, the depression hit, uh, mostly all over the world, but uh, in Canada here, uh, a lot of people lost their businesses and Ditchburn was one of them. Uh, late in 1932, a gentleman by the name of Alistair P. Hunter, who was a uh, designer and uh, superintendent slash supervisor at Ditchburn Boats, uh, bought the buildings here in Aurelia. As Alistair Hunter was a boat designer, he started his own line of boats, uh, mostly pleasure craft uh, and sailboats. He also built canoes. As it really had a thriving business in the tour industry, it was a uh, big business for the hunters. In 1939, the war, as I said, the World War II broke out. In 1940, the Canadian government uh, put out a contract for any small boat builders that could uh, build the fair mile and that it could uh, make its way down to uh, the St. Lawrence and to the East Coast. Therefore, uh, Alistair decided to sign a contract to build the fair mile. Fair Mile was uh, started in 1940 at Hunter Boats. As a matter of fact, they're uh, the first of seven built out of all the Fair Miles built here in Canada. There was a total of 88 Fair Miles built, uh, 15 built in Vancouver area, seven built in Weymouth, Nova Scotia, and the remainder built uh, in Ontario. 
The first uh, built by the hunters was uh, the Q060. Um, the call numbers had to be three digits and uh, the Q came from, I'm not sure, I'm still uh, searching. Uh, rumor goes that uh, when the Fair Mile reached Newfoundland, uh, they call it a Q boat for some reason, but uh, I'm still searching why it got called a Q boat. Um, in England, they call them MLs with a three digit number. The ML uh, stood for motor launch. The 060 was officially and the only uh, fair mile built in Canada officially named the Mariposa Bell. It comes from the Stephen Leacock's Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town book that he wrote many years ago. As I said, Hunter built a total of seven fair miles. They range from uh, 060, 061, 085, 093, 092 and 0109 and 116. As the Fairmile uh, got built through uh, different small uh, boat builders, a group was formed by Alistair Hunter and his son Don. Uh, what they would do, they would meet regular, regularly to uh, create and implement plans to improve the production of the Fairmile. As they would meet on a regular basis, uh, they made sure that everybody did the right jobs to make sure everything was put in place to build the fair mile. The fair mile uh, would eventually uh, make his way down to the east and west coast, uh, on the east coast here uh, th through the St. Lawrence, uh, to the St. John's Harbor and the port of Montreal. Uh, the fair miles were uh, aided by uh, two uh, larger ships. Uh, they're mostly supply ships. One was called the a HMCS Provider, and the other one was called the HMCS Preserver. What would they do? They would follow the fair miles up and down the uh, St. Lawrence and along the coast just to make sure that if anything broke down, they'd have the supplies to fix it. They even uh, had a small hospital if anybody got injured, and uh, their uh, an asset to uh, the fair mile. Jumping ahead to uh, 1943, uh, October, exactly October 13, 1943, the Q116, which was the last fair mile built, uh, was in, uh, here at Hunter Boats, uh, just finishing off uh, getting small things done so it could go on into Lake Cooch for a, a trial run and then eventually it would make its way down the Trent to Lake Ontario and then uh, down the St. Lawrence to uh, the Atlantic Ocean. The Fair Mile uh, was a unique ship and it was uh, a shame to see the uh, last one being sent off to the sea but uh, on October 13th, uh, well, the, the men working on the ship, they went out for dinner, came back around 7 p.m., uh, heard a dripping sound in the hull of the ship, mainly near the engine room. And uh, either the rumor goes it was either a light bulb or a short in a wiring system that uh, caught fire. It was quite the uh, fire of the... Uh, Aurelia Fire Brigade was called. Uh, they came about to uh, put out the fire. At the same time they reached there, an explosion occurred. Uh, six men were injured. And uh, one of those men were a young lad, 16 year old called Stanley Peacock. S Stanley Peacock was a member of the 99th uh, Lynx Aurelia Air Cadets. He was a student at ODCBI. And uh, like I said, he was only 16 years old. Uh, Stanley at the time was looking down the uh, hatch to see what was going on and the explosion occurred. 
it blew uh, Stanley right off the ship. The next day he was found in the water, deceased. Uh, the men who, uh, what were, who were injured were, give me a second here, sorry. Uh, their names were Ernest Justin, Reginald Bradley, Russell Hangton, Howard Brome, Harold Aris, Norman Johnson, John Stone, and uh, they uh, had major first degree and second degree burns and abrasives, and some of them had uh, fractures. Uh, incidentally, Norm Johnstone, uh, I happened to find out that he was the only crew member that got injured still living. I got his phone number from his nephew, Jim Pomeroy, and uh, I uh, gave him a phone call. But first, Jim told me I couldn't phone that night. We were talking with each other because his uncle was out curling in a championship round of, of Bondsville curling. And I talked to myself, oh boy, at 95, he must be pretty good shape. So I asked, uh, Asked Norm when I got talking to him, and uh, he said that the, he curls on a regular basis, and he curls like everybody else does, gets down on his knees and uh, pushes the rock like everybody else does, and I thought that was remarkable. Uh, talking with Norm, he was uh, quite enthusiastic about uh, seeing a monument being built here in Aurelia, as he did live in Aurelia, and it's a uh, would be a great idea to uh, have a monument built on the shores where uh, Fair Mile was built. Norm told me a few stories that uh, I thought was interesting, not only just because he, he curled, but uh, he was with uh, Stanley, right beside Stanley when the uh, fire erupted and the explosion occurred. Norm told me he was lucky enough to uh, jump out of the way and uh, only get uh, minor burns. And uh, he did get burns, uh, first degree and second degree. So that was pretty major. Every year, uh, there is a ceremony for Stanley Peacock um, that uh, we all remembered. Um, through the newspapers over the years, uh, services held over at uh, St. James Cemetery um, at the grave site on uh, October 13th. Uh, he was, uh, originally it was uh, organized by uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Ray Rothlaw, who was also a good friend of Stanley's uh, when they went to school. Ray never forgot uh, Stanley. Uh, for all these years. And uh, he thought it would be a good dedication to have a memorial for Stanley on the anniversary date of uh, the Fairmile explosion. Just recently, uh, Ray passed away and I'm sorry to uh, hear that, but uh, we'll continue having the ceremony for Stanley as uh, the years come by. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Fire Brigade, which was called Brigade back then, now it's called the Aurelia Fire Service, uh, rushed to the site and uh, pretty well got it under control. And uh, I feel that um, reading the article and uh, searching what happened that day, uh, the fire department pretty well saved the waterfront of Aurelia. There was numerous buildings, there was houses, retail stores, and especially there was a uh, Imperial Oil had their uh, supply tanks there. Also along the uh, Lake Shore, as uh, we know now it's called the Legion, it was the, the CPR train station that uh, was, existed back then. Uh, for their bravery, the uh, firemen did receive uh, medals. Um, Captain Robert Elgin Jones, 
and Lieutenant Daniel McLeish. Uh, they received the King George VI Police and Fire Service Medal for their gallantry. Also who received a medal uh, was Ernest Woody. He was a warrant officer for uh, the Navy at the time, and he was not on the ship, but just off the ship, and uh, he jumped on board to, to help uh, uh, rescue the gentleman. Uh, Ernest received uh, what they called back then the Albert Medal, which is now the uh, George Cross. There's a difference between the Albert Medal and the uh, King George uh, Medal. The Albert Medal is for life saving, and what she did, he pulled two men out of the uh, engine room and save their lives. And the uh, King George medal was for bravery and gallantry in which the uh, two firemen received. After the war, uh, 100 boats uh, continue uh, making boats, pleasure boats, that is. Um, as you see in the uh, screen here, uh, there's an artist uh, who lives here in Aurelia, Ada Torrance. She drew a picture of uh, one of the boats that um, Hunter Boats was famous for. They made uh, not just pleasure craft, but they, they made uh, sailboats. And at the time of the war, they were contracted to, to uh, make uh, a number of uh, crafts for the uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. Don Hunter took over uh, Hundred boats after uh, Alistair had uh, passed away. Um, through the years and into the 70s, uh, with a uh, declining demand for wooden boats, and this is when uh, fiberglass became the norm for, for boats. Uh, Hundred boats um, had to close their uh, business. In 1990, October 23rd, Hundred boats caught fire. Uh, it burned right to the ground, and uh, that was a shame that uh, these buildings uh, do not exist anymore. Uh, from what I understand, the uh, city of Aurelia bought the land, and now uh, that uh, if you've been down to uh, by the Legion, uh, it's called Veterans Park, and the skateboard is down there, and um, it is um, where Hunter Boats was. Um, you'll see on the screen, there's a pathway that goes uh, just past the uh, a monument, the soldier's monument uh, that was installed a few years back. And on the left where you see the arrow, uh, that's pretty well where uh, Hunter Boats uh, had their buildings. And a matter of fact, if you just so happen to be down in the park there, you'll still see the pylons in the water where uh, Hunter Boats sat. Between Rick uh, Purcell and myself, we're work we've been like I said earlier, we've been working on a uh, the monument to memorize the tragedy and heroism that occurred the night of October thirteenth, nineteen forty three. This is a special. This is truly historical story that needs to be told by way of this monument and belt Aurelius history. This monument will be uh, a four-sided monument uh, when it's all drawn up, and uh, it will tell the story of the Fair Mile, Hunter Boats, Stanley Peacock, and the fireman who uh, saved the Williams Lakeshore. Through a donation, you can keep this story alive, which will pass on to generations to come. Uh, we would be grateful if you could send a donation to have this monument built and you could send your a, a donation to the Aurelia Legion in care of the Aurelia Legion, the Fair Mile Fund, and the address is 215 Mississauga Street, Aurelia. Uh, any donation would be grateful. Uh, I really like would like to see this uh, monument built to tell this historic story. For those who don't know what the Legion is, um, 
the Royal Canadian Legion has 1,350 branches across Canada, 400 branches in Ontario alone. The Legion serves vet mainly serves veterans, Army veterans, or defense veterans and military, along with the RCMP. They serve their families to promote remembrance, to serve our communities. And uh, with your membership, uh, you can help uh, the Legion survive and uh, do the things they do the best. Like I say, they uh, help out the community as far as uh, local. We do youth programs, help those in need. Uh, example, uh, we give money to uh, Soldiers Memorial Hospital. Uh, we give money to the Lighthouse, who uh, uh, houses uh, homeless people. And uh, we have a number of programs for youth. And uh, we have um, served the, uh, we have a Legion Baseball League, et cetera. So uh, if you get your membership, uh, it also gives you perks. Um, the uh, National Legion as a uh, command has uh, partnered together with a, a number of brand named uh, companies and uh, retail stores uh, to give uh, us Legion members a discount. And uh, if you uh, do buy your discount, you'd have to uh, put in your number and uh, every month they have a, a special uh, deal going on. So uh, join the Legion, it's fun. Uh, we have one of the best views in uh, Canada, uh, right on Lake Kuchiching and uh, drop down, say hello and uh, have a drink. The legacy of the Fair Mile is very important. Why we remember it, it was a little ship that helped save the war and give us our freedom we have today. The Fair Mile uh, has gone unnoticed for too many years and I feel that uh, it should be a um, little ship to be reckoned with, or to be, sorry, to be recognized. The Fair Mile uh, did an important part during World War II. And uh, I'm sure uh, at that time, everybody was grateful those ships were built. Once again, thank you for watching and uh, you have a good night. All right. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, so folks, um, many of you will know the drill already, but if you have any questions for Rob, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A. If you move your mouse, you'll see that function at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom bar. I'll read them aloud so that you can, everybody can hear what the question was that was posed and then Rob will answer them for us. Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing here because it's a little hard to see the, the questions at the same time. Um, and we already do have some questions coming in. So um, you ready? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so from Janet, why do you think this story of the Fair Miles and the firefighters' heroics isn't more widely known in Aurelia? Well, until uh, I guess uh, myself and Rick Purcell came along, along with Ray Rapflab, uh, nobody would have known about the, the Fair Mile. Um, incidentally, uh, I found out the Fair Mile through Ray. Uh, when we went to the uh, grave site ceremony um, a few years ago. And then I, I wrote the story on the, I searched and I wrote the story on the fair mile. Um, so we have a question from Trish. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, sorry, me, I mentioned that Rob is the curator at the Legion. So um, Rob, can you tell us a bit about the artifacts that you have at the Legion? What's your collection like? Yeah, at the, uh, War Museum. I'm. Uh, I got the collection of, uh, or we have the collection of uh, many artifacts. Uh, numbers I can't tell you. There's hundreds, uh, anywhere from uh, swords to guns to caps to uh, homemade. Uh, they call it trench uh, artifacts. That uh, when the men were bored sitting in the trench, they would uh, make out of uh, 
uh, bombs and uh, different shells, uh, different things. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, model ships in the Navy room that incidentally, that's what I do. I build model ships in my spare time and uh, they're in the uh, museum also. Uh, I got a little bit of a tour with Rob the other day uh, when I stopped in to get a couple of photos for the presentation. And it's a really amazing collection. Um, I guess on that note, Rob, can can anybody stop in and see the collection? Yes, anybody could stop by. Uh, we're open uh, from noon till uh, 6 p.m. Uh, weekly. Uh, during the weekend, I think it's a little bit later. You'd have to phone the office um, at our branch 34 in Aurelia. Uh, the phone number is 705-325-8442. And you could ask them uh, the times uh, we are open. Yes, you're most welcome to come in and watch. Matter of fact, we have one of the largest uh, uh, museums of uh, these type of artifacts uh, in Ontario. Um, so there's a question uh, from someone that says, why was the Fair Mile built with wood and not steel? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. The Fair Mile was built with wood mainly because uh, steel was very scarce. Uh, the Defense Department's uh, pretty well in Canada here and all over the world. Uh, we're using steel to build tanks, trucks, Jeeps, and of, of course, uh, other metal products they needed to uh, in the war. Now, these were all wooden boat builders to begin with. Did that have anything to do with it, do you think? Uh, not really. It's a fact that uh, they decided that wood wouldn't be so scarce and that uh, the call for uh, these uh, professional uh, pretty well professional carpenters and woodworkers uh, they are more abundant to uh, come along and uh, help build the fair mine. Okay. Um, we've got a comment here from Edwin uh, that says oh I ju it just moved on me hold on hold on there we go uh, no idea. My first 20 years of life were growing up in Aurelia and swimming and fishing in the waterfront. While I recognized the hunter boat buildings and rolling boats, I never knew of this history of the Fairmount. Thank you very much. I'm with you, Edmund. I grew up um, in Aurelia and had no idea that we had this incredible history right on our waterfront. Um, Edwin also says, what is your expected budget for the monument project? Expected budget would uh, be uh, roughly $20,000. And uh, we're hoping to raise that by October 13th on the 80th anniversary of uh, this uh, Fair Mile uh, explosion. Um, a question from someone who I think may know you says, you built a model of the Fair Mile. One of the things you can see in your collection, right? Uh, can you tell us about that? The model of the fair mile I built, main reason was to show what it was. And uh, if anybody asked to talk about the history of the fair mile, um, I put it in our museum. I, uh, if I'm talking to uh, different groups about uh, the fair mile <coughs> explosion, um, I take it along with me uh, to uh, show the people in a way what it really looked like. Uh, Unless you were, you're really there to see where the guns are and the little different things that were on the uh, deck of the fair mile, you could maybe visualize in the picture, but to see it in the model, it kind of gives you more idea of what it was. Um, we have another comment here from Dave who says, great topic, glad I saw this in science. And in. my dad worked one summer at Hunter's building a fair mile when he was 16 years old. I grew up at my grandfather's cottage at Bay Park and fondly remember visiting Hunter's and Buchanan Motors down the road with my dad in the late 1960s. Thank you. And I will drop in when in town. Uh, visit Rob and come visit Oma too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, question from Deanne. Do you know if there are fair miles that are preserved or still in use in some form or fashion? I was wondering this also. I looked that up, and as far as I know, in Canada, we have no fair miles uh, that are um, still in the water. 
um, down in Port Dover just not too long ago, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, there was three of them down there that uh, eventually rotted and sunk. Uh, I understand um, three or four were restored in uh, England and they're uh, be made into luxury liner, not luxury liners, but luxury boats being 112 feet long. There, there's a lot of room in there to call luxury. Um, that's the only ones I uh, do of. Okay. Um, there's another question that's come in in relation to uh, just the model that you built. Is there another model of the Fairmile at the Aurelia City offices? Yes, there is one, a, a rather large one to scale. I guess it's about eight feet long. It is um, at City Hall. If you go into City Hall, turn left, go down the hallway, it uh, you'll see it there. Okay. Um, so another question here, was it difficult for the Fairmiles to navigate the Trent Severn waterway? If Mr. Hunter had, a, uh, had to change the design of it, probably yes. Uh, he shortened, uh, he um, shortened it and he uh, made the width about a foot smaller because the Trent waterway is, if I understand, is 22 feet wide and uh, 18 feet, uh, the original design, 18 feet, 18 foot six, I understand, would be pretty close to uh, maneuvering down the uh, trend. Um, all right, what uh, what naval class of vessel was the Penetang 88? You know anything about that? No, the Pen I'd have to look that up. Um, so similar to what you said before, what happened to the decommissioned fair miles? The decommissioned fair miles, uh, I also found out that uh, it took roughly $80,000 to build the uh, fair miles during the war. Uh, uh, when they were decommissioned, uh, some went for training to the mid 50s and then they were uh, decommissioned there. And uh, most of them were all sold off. Believe it or not, for three thousand dollars. That's a far cry from eighty thousand dollars. All right. Um, can you expand on the role the firefighters played that day to save lives and property? I can give you a, a rough idea from when I searched. Was uh, that the um, firemen when they got there? There was a, uh, a naturally a. a fire already uh, had begun. They, um, I don't know how many trucks they had back then, but uh, the, uh, apparently they put out the fire pretty quick, uh, just uh, before the explosion. Um, it's, uh, no matter what they did, which was significant to save the waterfront, Nova Rota. And at massive risk to their own safety. Oh, yes, yes. That's um, any firefighter risks his, his life to uh, when he's uh, gone to a fire call. Now, you mentioned to me as well, which I didn't realize that Ferma Q116 had just been fueled up. Is that right? Yes. Um, it just been, like I said, it was going up for, ready to go out for maneuvers on Lake Kuchitsing and then uh, head down to uh, the next day down to, uh, towards the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they just filled up with 2,300 gallons of high octane gas because the uh, all Scott engines were run on gas. Uh, later on, some of the fair miles were uh, uh, equipped with uh, diesel engines as most, uh, um, naval vessels are today. Um, all right, we have a comment from Wendy who says, uh, thank you for helping us learn about and remember yet another piece of Canadian World War II history. Very interesting, which I agree. Thank you, Wendy. Um, all right, and a, a couple of questions here from Therese, um, who says, thank you, first off. Um, so much history in Aurelia, and I'm pleased you are bringing this hidden history to the present. What fundraisers will the Aurelia Legion be having? 
to raise the funds to honor those in the explosion. Start with that and then I'll get to the second part of the question. Okay, as of right now, um, fundraising uh, I've been doing, and Rick Purcell, our president, um, I've been going around talking to different service groups. Um, after we, uh, I finished talking to the service groups, um, we will go public uh, through the media and uh, ask for donations. Uh, right now we have uh, nothing planned to uh, uh, raise money as of yet, but uh, things are in the works. So we're having a meeting next week to find what else we can uh, raise money to uh, get this monument built. Great. Thank you for your call, Therese. Um, and the second part of Therese's comment or question here is, um, how long would it have taken to build a fair mile and have it shipped out? Okay, uh, fair miles were built in record-breaking time. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, Hunter Boat Works uh, built seven fair miles in the site of three years. So that's a little over two boats a year, and that's two ships a year, pardon me. Um, that's pretty quick to build a, a ship. Um, and someone says also, what was being protected by the fair miles? Uh, what was being protected by the fair? Yeah, so oh, what were they protecting okay. against? Sorry about that. Um, kind of went through my head there. The uh, fair miles were out uh, to protect the uh, cargo ships and supply ships were going, which were going to England. Uh, as uh, some of you, if uh, you know World War II history, um, England was getting bombed by the Germans and uh, pretty well destroyed. And uh, they had nothing as far as uh, food goes, supply any kind of supplies. And uh, Canada was uh, one of the only countries that, uh, on a regular basis, sent over cargo ships and supply ships to uh, supply uh, England with uh, necessities. Great. All right. Uh, well, it looks like that is all our questions for the evening. Okay. Um, I think we've bombarded you enough for one night. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. Thank you again, Rob, uh, for your time. This has been uh, fascinating. And like you keep saying, spread the word, tell people, spread, right? Spread the word. And one thing I forgot to mention is the reason why the Fair Mile was built, uh, not just to um, cover the coast for uh, the German submarines, uh, trying to uh, destroy these uh, cargo supply ships is uh, because uh, there's, like I said, they're spotted up and down the St. Lawrence and that's pretty close to home when it comes to uh, enemy uh, ships coming uh, to our country. So uh, kudos out to the fair mile. Yeah. Thanks absolutely. again for watching. Yeah. Um, so thank you again to Monica for running the presentation this evening. Thanks to you all for joining us. Thanks again to our partner over at Rogers TV, Deanne. Um, and uh, thank you, Trish.